The most complete hypothesis for the earliest hominin that we have of, the one that has the most fossil evidence behind it, is what we refer to as Ardipithecus. The people in this picture, Johannes Haile Selassie, Berhani Hasfa, Tim White, Owen Lovejoy, Gensua, have been involved in work with Ardipithecus going back nearly 20 years. And while they've been working on these specimens for more than 20 years, only recently have they published on a phenomenal partial skeleton of Ardipithecus, pictured in an artist's illustration right here, that reflects a complete view of what they argue is the earliest hominin morphology. And they've developed an elaborate set of arguments both about interpreting the fossil evidence itself and also theoretical models as to why Ardipithecus came to exist. Now again, Ardipithecus is found here in East Africa, in Ethiopia, in a region known as the Afar Triangle, and specifically within a region of that known as the Middle Awash Valley. Now, Ardipithecus is actually divided into two separate species by its discoverers. There's earlier evidence, which comes primarily in the form of dental and mandibular remains, that was referred to as Ardipithecus cadaba, that we think dates to about six million years ago in time on the basis of radiometric dating of the deposits that these fossils are found in. The later specimens, referred to as Ardipithecus ramidus, date to almost four million years ago, dating back to closer to 4.5 to 4.8 million years of age. Ardipithecus ramidus, on the basis of its dental morphology, has been argued to be a lineal descendant of Ardipithecus cadaba. In other words, these two simply represent an earlier and a later lineage of the same species. The relatively complete individual that was recently published is this individual on the right here, and this is a representative of Ardipithecus ramidus. This specimen dates to about 4.4 million years of age, and its morphology, cranial morphology, postcranial morphology, the morphology of its pelvis, the morphology of its hands, the morphology of its feet, have all given us a radically different perspective onto what the earliest hominin may have looked like. Zooming in at some of these features in more detail, let's look at the skull and the pelvis, two of the most important features of this specimen. Looking at the skull, there are two images that we have available to us right here. These top four set of images represent a reconstruction based on a CT scan of the specimen itself, where individual bony components were reconstructed on the computer to form a complete specimen. Now this specimen, the CT reconstruction, was actually done independently from a physical reconstruction, where casts of individual bony fragments were physically reconstructed into a skull to try and test whether or not the reconstructions appear to be valid given the morphology of the specimens. These two were compared, and it was deemed by the authors of the study that in fact they did represent a valid reconstruction. The two teams working relatively independently were able to reproduce basically consistent models of what this skull may have looked like. And when we look at this skull, we can see in many ways a very ape-like skull. It has a very small cranial capacity. Unlike apes, it has a slightly reduced anterior snout. Recall that apes have this projecting rostrum off the front of the face. Ardipithecus, while still having much more of a snout than we would associate with humans today, has a reduced one. Corresponding to this reduced snout is also a reduction in dental size, particularly canine dentition size. You can see on the RD skeleton, the 4.4 million year old one, that the canine is quite small. Um, now this might be in part because this is a female individual with smaller canines, but this is a reduced canine that is in many ways much more reduced than ape-like canines we're used to seeing. It still retains some of that diamond shape that we associate with ape canines, but we also have the development of a distal tubercle along the back of the skull. And notice that we don't have the kind of honing complex that we saw in apes. There's no diastema between the canine and the first premolar. There's no space here to allow for that lower canine to insert itself in here, and there doesn't seem to be that kind of honing wear between the upper canine and lower canine that we expect to see in the presence of a honing complex. So even if it's still a slightly projecting canine, it doesn't have the same kind of honing complex that we see in apes. We can see that also in the jaw, shown here in the lower right picture here. You can again see that this canine is not a big diamond-shaped canine. There's no gap between the canine and the first premolar, and the premolar doesn't appear to have the specialized morphology that we associate with a honing complex. Instead, it has a more human-like pattern. So although it's an ape-like brain, and an ape-like jaw in terms of many of its proportions, it has human-like dentition in a lot of ways. Another, more unseen aspect of the more human-like dentition is the fact that the enamel thickness across the molars, these posterior dentition, is relatively thick. The living African apes, 
chimpanzees and gorillas, have thin enamel on their molar teeth. Humans have thicker enamel. Australopithecines, who we'll discover in a week or so, have very thick enamel on the molar. So an expansion in molar enamel thickness is thought to correspond with the origin of more hominin-like teeth. So these teeth have also been used to argue for a hominin-like morphology to Artipithecus. The pelvis, however, is perhaps the most important specimen within this assemblage. Unfortunately, as you can see from these images, the pelvis is very poorly preserved. Although the entire structure is there, fracturing and breaking and cracking of the specimen have significantly distorted what we have available to us. The images on the right represent a CD rendering of a reconstruction of that specimen, an idealized reconstruction of that specimen, where this distortion from the cracking has been removed. Again, this reconstruction is itself a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis of what this fragmentary individual would have looked like had we recovered a complete specimen. So it's important to recognize that one step in the scientific process has already been taken, a step associated with reconstruction. But when we look at this pelvis, we can see a much more human-like pelvis than what we see in the apes. For example, if we compare this specimen to what we see in a chimpanzee, Here's a chimpanzee bone, equivalent bone, an ascoxae. We can see that the Artipithecus pelvis is much more flared out. It's approaching the bowl-like condition that we see in humans, with a lot of space associated with the flare of the upper part of the ascoxae here. In contrast, that chimpanzee pelvis is straight and flat, associated with the role that it plays in linking the lower limb of a chimpanzee with the torso of a chimpanzee. In the case of Artipithecus, the authors have argued that this bowl-like structure again reflects the very different role that the pelvis plays in a bipedal organism over a quadrupedal organism, or at least a habitually bipedal organism. That this flare represents important muscular attachments associated with bipedal locomotion, and also support for an upper torso that's situated directly on top of the lower limbs. So this pelvis has been used to argue again that we have a bipedal individual. Now, interestingly, the bipedality in Artipithecus is not the same as the bipedality that we'll see in humans. The bipedality that's been argued for this specimen, Artipithecus ramidus, has been argued to be habitual bipedality, not necessarily obligate bipedality, a topic that we'll return to next week. By habitual bipedality, they mean to differentiate the idea that this individual was specialized only for walking but instead mean to say that this individual habitually walked bipedally, but still retained important abilities to be, be able to climb and utilize arboreal resources. If we go back to that original image, the artistic rendering, one of the things you'll see from this specimen is that they've reconstructed on the basis of some of the foot bones, the individual to have a grasping large toe on its foot. This grasping toe reflects, as you can see in this image, an important adaptation to being able to still be an adept tree climber, to be able to utilize arboreal resources and arboreal surfaces for locomotion. The limb proportions, especially the upper limb, also reflect an adaptation towards continued climbing activity. So the bipedality of Artipithecus is not a specialized bipedality, but rather a habitual bipedality, associated with, with a more generalized locomotor pattern, one that still includes significant time spent utilizing arboreal resources and moving through an arboreal environment. Now, perhaps most interestingly about Artipithecus is they've published a very elaborate model as to why Artipithecus came to exist. What were the key evolutionary changes that gave rise from a common ancestor in the past to Artipithecus, the earliest member of the hominin lineage. This figure here represents that model. Now there's a lot of complexity in this image that for the most part we can ignore for the moment, but I want to focus in on a few key aspects. First of all, again, they assume an ancestral condition contributing towards Artipithecus, both from the Miocene last common ancestor with the apes and also the specimens that immediately precede Artipithecus. And the key takeaways from these are that they reconstruct that ancestor as having begun to move into a different environment, in this case areas of the lower canopy, that allowed them to begin to shift their ecology to more high-value food items. Simultaneously, this allowed them to deal with a problem that they inherited from their ape ancestry, one of low reproductive potential. Recall that one of the features that apes share is that they have very long interbirth intervals. Living apes today oftentimes have five to six to seven years in between live births. 
So this represents an evolutionary disadvantage for apes. It reduces their potential reproductive potential. So being able to increase the reproductive potential would be one potential evolutionary adaptation or advantage that a hominin ancestor might be able to overcome. So, and if we look at then how they're able to do that, the argument for Artipithecus centers on three key traits. The development of bipedality, the loss of a honing canine, or in this case a sectoral cutting canine, but basically that kind of ape-like honing canine, and the loss of visible estrus. Recall again also that the apes regularly have sexual swellings, where female individuals have a swelling, a bright colorful swelling of their genitalia associated with times when they're reproductively fertile. Humans lack this feature. The discoverers of Artipithecus have argued that one of the things that comes along with the origins of hominins is a loss of this kind of sexual characteristics in the earliest hominins. The way these three traits fit together is that the authors argue that bipedality again associated with an ecological change, frees up the hands to do different kinds of foraging activities. Potentially the production of some kinds of tools, but some kind of different extractive foraging. And by extractive foraging, they mean the ability to take food from one place and move it to another, to extract it from its location. By being able to move food, and again recall that when we see chimpanzees walking bipedally, it's often because they're doing just that activity, moving food. But by being able to move food, they are able potentially to provide food to gain additional reproductive access, to essentially exchange food for sex. This has been an argument that's made for chimpanzee hunting behaviors, although some would disagree with that interpretation of chimpanzee hunting. But by being able to provide additional resources to females, it's possible that these early hominins were able to have more live births to reduce that interbirth interval to a shorter time period. The ability to reduce, say, one to two years between live births potentially represents a huge evolutionary advantage in terms of the amount of reproductive potential a species might have. Provisioning of females is then associated with a loss of antagonism associated with reproductive competition, corresponding to the loss of that honing canine. Again, recall that primates that have large canine dimorphism oftentimes use those canines in the context of male-male competition for mates. So the loss of a honing complex could be associated with changes in reproductive behavior associated with male-male competition for female mating resources. The third element of this triad, development of ovulatory crypsis or hidden ovulation, is more controversial in the sense that there's no fossil evidence to support it and there can't be any fossil evidence to support it. It's inherently a soft tissue element and something that won't preserve in the fossil record. So it's more hypothetical and more difficult to interrogate. Now, in thinking about how this model works, recall again that a model, a good model, will produce predictions that we can test in the fossil record. And indeed, there are predictions within this model that are available for us to test. Not only the bipedality of the skeleton and the loss of a sectoral honing canine, but also things like increased male body size, associated perhaps with a reduction in sexual dimorphism. Also potentially decreased territoriality, something that potentially is accessible if we look at the distribution of fossils across a landscape. They also argue for a reduced core area or a reduced foraging area for these hominins, which again is something that potentially we can access through the fossil record. So there are a number of features of this model that potentially generate predictions that we can test.